People often say that there is a war against nature and that this is the third world war. It's getting more stark, it's getting worse, and, uh, and the rate of change is accelerating, whether we're talking about the uh, extinction of species or the thoroughness of the technoculture. The world right now is frankly very frightening uh, for what we consider to be uh, industrial civilization, I would say, is extraordinarily uncivilized, um, actually quite savage. It's not an exaggeration to say that we're living in an ecological apocalypse. Between the years 1980 and 2045, we will lose more species of plants and animals than have been lost in the last 65 million years. We have two big picture time pressures that really mean we should be acting a lot more urgently than most of us have. And one of them is, is peak oil or energy collapse, and one of them is climate change or runaway global warming. I think that most people, even most scientists, continue to underestimate how far down the path to climate catastrophe we've already traveled. For the most part, we're oblivious to it. We don't want to know about it. We don't want to hear about it. The one thing I'm most afraid of is that we're going to mount a tremendous campaign to sustain the unsustainable. At this point, the scientists are saying that the Earth's temperature may increase by as much as 10 degrees. At that point, there may not even be bacteria left. When the oil starts to really run dry, and when those in power have to assert their power in a time of dwindling resources, I think they're going to turn to much more blunt and cruel methods of enforcing their power. The whole climate is changing. The winds, the ocean currents, the storm patterns, snowpack, snowmelt, flooding, droughts. Stunning how fast the destruction is proceeding. Every day that passes, the world is in worse shape. The sad looking man you see on the screen is Derek Jensen. Jensen is the best selling author of several non fiction books, including A Language Older Than Words and A Culture of Make Believe. His books deal with topics such as surveillance, child abuse, the environment, and something he calls civilization. But it's statements like these that make him so controversial. They're thinking of raising the Shasta Dam in California, and the reason that Feinstein gave, Senator Feinstein gave, was um, it is Californians' God-given right to water their lawns. 
you know, there is no way to argue with that. Um, <laughs> except with explosives. That was Mr. Jensen in 2006, the same year he published a two-volume set called Endgame. In Endgame, he argues that there is an urgent need to bring down civilization. If people would have brought down civilization 100 years ago, people in the Pacific Northwest could still eat salmon. There's gonna be people sitting along the Columbia 50 years from now, and they're glowing for one thing, but they'll be starving to death, and they'll be saying, I'm starving to death because you didn't take out the dams that killed salmon. And those dams were used for barging and for electricity, for aluminum smelters, for beer cans, so. God damn you. He lays out his case against civilization by enumerating 20 premises. Due to time limitations and the fact that most people would not tolerate a 20 hour movie, we will explore four of these premises and accompany them with real life examples. Industrial civilization, civilization itself, but especially industrial civilization, is not and can never be sustainable. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that any way of life that's based on the use of non-renewable resources won't last. Civilization is a way of life characterized by the growth of cities. So you've got groups of people living in a dense enough population that the local land base cannot support them. What that means is you have to get your basic resources from somewhere else because you've used them up where you live. So you're going to go out into the countryside and gather up whatever it is you want, bring it back in. If you require the importation of resources, what that means is you've denuded the landscape of that particular resource. There's no way that in the long term you can continue to uh, destroy uh, the land that you need for your survival uh, or the waters that you need to drink and expect to continue to live. Industrial civilization requires ever-increasing amounts of energy and ever-increasing amounts of land, ever-increasing amounts of resources of all kinds in order to perpetuate itself, in order to continue to grow, in order to just maintain itself. And we live on a finite planet and those aren't available. Uh, of course, unfortunately for us and most living creatures, that culture won't stop until it's consumed as much as it can, or of course until we stop it ourselves. If you have a finite amount of anything, if you start using it, eventually you use it up. And so it would seem that if your entire culture is based on, I don't know, let's take a random resource, oil, that you would think about what's going to happen when the oil runs out. We found energy resources that have allowed us to escape some of the uh, kinds of limits that previous cultures have had to face much more quickly. It used to collapse because they ran out of resources, easily accessible resources, the limit being the distance that people could travel with things like horses or other pack animals. That ended with the, the, the beginning of the fossil fuel age. Now they can go all over the planet and take what they want. So globalization has only accelerated this um, tremendously destructive process we poured our, uh, our wealth into building an infrastructure for daily life that has no future. I do think that the oil problem is going to accelerate within the next uh, three to five years, maybe even sooner. The numbers indicate that we've probably peaked in global production.
where do you find the break from that? I mean, it's all of it is a, is a giant machine or ensemble that just moves forward. Technology, for example, never takes a step back. This, this whole thing just keeps going like a cancer. I don't know of any civilization that's been sustainable. I don't believe there ever has been one. Technology really in its essence is our culture's determination that comes from certain philosophical and historical sources that we will be nothing else but more relentlessly technological. There is no like clean green path to living at a lifestyle that we're all used to in industrialized nations. This way of life is over. Civilizations are often cutting their own throats very visibly, very obviously, but they just keep on doing it. Every civilization is defined by hubris. It's, it's defined by its denial to recognize that it lives in a natural world. Uh, as a matter of fact, every civilization in its founding lives elevates itself above nature and claims that it is the controller of the whole world. The first written myth of this culture is Gilgamesh deforesting the plains and hillsides of Iraq. When people think of Iraq, is the first thing they normally think of cedar forests so thick that sunlight never touches the ground? That's how it was prior to the arrival of this culture. So as a longtime grassroots environmental activist and as a creature living in the thrashing endgame of civilization, I am intimately acquainted with the landscape of loss and have grown accustomed to carrying the daily weight of despair. I've walked clear cuts that wrap around mountains and drop into valleys and climb ridges to fragment watershed after watershed. And I've sat silent near empty streams that two generations ago were lashed into whiteness by uncountable salmon coming home to spawn and die. Out here in BC and across North America, when they do industrial logging, they actually take and just remove all the trees. They, they level everything. They leave nothing but stumps and slash piles. And, uh, and they burn the slash piles and they take out all the timber. And what's left is a wasteland. It's like they take a rainforest and turn it into a desert. That's what a clear cut is. They use them for pulp, uh, they export them whole to the United States and to Japan. Um, there's not very much milling that happens anymore in BC, it's just getting exported for pulp and paper and fiberboard and plywood and whatever else. Not a lot of value added. This tree has been selected to be cut and uh, usually the company will only clear cut, but this tree is in what they call a Streamside selection zone. That's why they've got it marked blue because it's a selection zone. In a clear cut, they won't they won't paint the trees that they're uh, going to cut down. They only paint the ones that they're going to leave. There's still a strong push to har harvest as much of the western red cedar as they can. They're bringing in huge helicopters to do that. And they're high grading, selecting the only, only the really good high quality timber and leaving the rest laying there. You know. 
in a junk heap. So that's why we keep on, you know, fighting back. I think the last straw was when they wanted to log the Valley of Ista because of its historical and spiritual significance to our people. But they log it in spite, you know, just to make a point against our resistance, against our, our overall uh, position, you know, with regards to treaties or encroachments of um, industry development in our territories. In a lot of these areas, like this uh, clearing behind me up on the hill, you can see the soil is exposed. The uh, uh, ultraviolet kills off all the uh, the mosses, the funguses that hold the forest to uh, hold the soil together. When the stumps rot and the roots die, then the, the then the slopes slide, and often there's not much regrowth. There's no regeneration of the forest. They do some replanting. Uh, it doesn't always work because there's no soil left. It washes down into the streams, it kills the salmon, it fills up the reservoirs, uh, it causes all kinds of flood damage downstream. That's terrorism. Stripping down uh, all the trees, ripping out the trees in the forest, and now they're going to rip out the, the guts of the land with them, um, looking for copper and gold. And. There has to be some kind of focus to uh, address the injustice to our people, the injustice to the land, to the water, to the wildlife, the injustice to the marine life and the salmon life, and the injustice to the people that want to stand up for it. When we block the road, these trees are very valuable and uh, the laws are all profit driven, they're all driven by the corporations. The police are there to enforce the corporation's right to log, not to enforce our right to stop them and protect the ecosystem. There's so little that's left of the old growth forest like this that we see on the sides here that people are putting their bodies on the line. They are willing to make huge sacrifices to stop the forest from being sacrificed and the water and the air quality and the global climate. Traditional communities do not often voluntarily give up or sell the resources on which their communities are based until their communities have been destroyed. They also do not willingly allow their land bases to be damaged so that other resources, gold, oil, and so on, can be extracted. It follows that those who want the resources will do what they can to destroy traditional communities. People, we say, have been there since time immemorial. Uh, prior to invasion and uh, conquest, colonization, lands in North America were occupied by populations of people that had a profoundly different relationship with the land. They live with the land. All the ceremonies that have come up have to do with celebrating the renewal of seasons and life and affirming all of that. One thing about indigenous peoples is that there's always the idea that you, you have to live in balance. And you know, emotionally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, you have to have balance. And so this same philosophy was applied to the natural world that they lived in. The Talawa, on whose land I now live, weren't civilized. They didn't live in cities. They didn't require the importation of resources. They lived in villages, camps. And they lived there for 12,500 years, if you believe the myths of science. If you believe the myths of the Talawa, they lived there since the beginning of time. I think that 
what we have had in indigenous societies all along is a very kind of common sense, a very practical approach to uh, why it's important to uh, treat uh, the world around you, the natural world, in a good way. Our people never exploited more than what we needed. We respect the land, we respect the animals, we respect the water, we respect the air, the wind, the fire, all the sacred elements. And we believe that they all are living, living things. So I suspect that's the way it was before contact. The stories that we have about our relationship to each other and to the land and to any spiritual aspect, any deities, arise from our relationship with the land. And the salmon were considered to be our um, mentors, caregivers, life givers. But they were equal to us. In fact, all, all things that have form were equal to us. We weren't about dominating. The spiritual relationship that our peoples had uh, prior to invasion uh, with all of creation and recognizing that all beings uh, have a spiritual uh, essence, a spiritual entity, and that if we want to uh, live in this universe in a good way, that it was absolutely essential that we learned how to maintain respectful relations with all of creation. When Europeans came to this land, it was with such a rapacious appetite. Uh, it still has not been sated. They brought Christianity. They brought uh, colonization. Uh, and certainly they did bring civilization. They came in and they were sent with this commission they felt apparently to dominate the land and it was just basically there for the taking. These people would accept beads or just kind of get out of the way and of course they had superior firepower at that time too. Right off the bat with uh, Christopher Columbus landing in the, the Caribbean region on what is today uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, they initiated almost immediately a genocide down there that depopulated most of the nation there, the Taino and the Arawaks and uh, one of the main things that happened was the introduction of diseases, which was basically biological warfare. The smallpox was spread through tobacco and blankets and given to the Indian people. So it didn't take them long to, to be decimated because um, they were pure. And the smallpox was vicious, very vicious. When Europeans came, much of what they were interested in was rapid uh, resource exploitation. They wanted to get wealthy in the New World. And as they were seeking that wealth, uh, they worked with indigenous nations to undermine traditional economies and undermine the relationship that indigenous populations have with the land so that indigenous peoples could then do the work of resource exploitation and extraction uh, for the Europeans so that they could get wealthy. In imposing those things on indigenous peoples, of course, they destroyed indigenous peoples and their nations and their way of life. Generally, indigenous people suffered 90% uh, or more uh, depopulation rate upon having contact with Europeans. It was a genocide, a uh, war for territory, because the Europeans wanted to take the resources. Settler society has uh, worked to destroy what it needs to live, and uh, that's suicidal. It's a suicidal mission. There's no way that it can be sustainable in the long term. I gave a talk in Oregon a couple years ago, and this guy afterwards said, you know, my, I don't, you talk a lot about this culture being based on violence, but I don't see it. You know, I'm not violent. And I said, okay, first off, where's your shirt made? And he looked and it was made in Bangladesh. It's like, look, do we even need to talk about that? He's fucking faking he's dead. Thank you, breathing. He's faking he's fucking dead. Yeah, he just 
Our way of living, industrial civilization, is based on, requires, and will collapse very quickly without persistent and widespread violence. The arcing up with is a large, a large explosion, a large explosion. Wow. I'll just take a couple eggs. How many do you want? Uh, two. Two, two is good. Okay. And then some, what next? Some ham. Great. Tomato. Tomato. Okay. How about that? Okay, some onion. Onion? Ooh, and cheese. Everything then, right? Okay, yes, everything. everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I understand. Okay, we'll just pop this on. Now watch. I'm chopping the ham and veggies, grating the cheese, and whipping the eggs all in three seconds. The machine that just made those smoothies for Berman and Fred will make an omelet. There's not much time left to get this beautiful Hulk diamond necklace less than 50 Whoa. seconds. Joanne? Absolutely, John. You're going to want to give us a call to get this beautiful Hope Diamond Necklace. This is a 45.52 carat diamond surrounded by 16 white diamonds. It has a platinum chain bearing 46 more diamonds. These are 12 4-ounce Southern Barbecue Chicken Breasts. These Stuff and Gourmet Farm Fresh Chicken Breasts come from their barnyard to your backyard. They're wonderfully marinated and guaranteed to be tender, juicy, and downright delicious. Fine tune those measurements. We keep them on file. They're saved there on our computer. Go back into the section where you reorder and fine tune those measurements for us. Um, and then we'll have a chance to send you another pair of customized jeans that we really believe are going to fit perfectly. So we're going to do a countdown, uh, starting from five. Everybody got to help me out here. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh! It worked. Second, I said, okay, do you pay rent? He's like, yeah. And I said, why? And he said, because I don't own. And I said, no, 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 what would happen if you didn't pay rent? He said, well, the sheriff would come and evict me. I said, I don't know what that means. What, what would happen? He said, well, the sheriff would come, and he would knock on the door. I said, okay, great. What happens if you open the door, and you say, hey, I'm just finishing up making dinner. You want some? And so the sheriff sits down, you feed him, you don't poison him. And then uh, after dinner, you say, well, you know, you've been somewhat pleasant company, but not all that pleasant, so I would like for you to leave my home now. What would happen? He said, well, the sheriff would pull out his gun, and he'd say, I'm here to evict you because you didn't pay rent. I said, ah, so the reason you pay rent is because if you don't, some guy with a gun is going to come and take you away. He said, I think I get it. I said, well, let's try again. So what happens if you're hungry, so you go to the grocery store, and you start eating? What's going to happen? So we're going to call the sheriff. I said, yeah, it's the same guy who's going to come with a gun and take you away. He's a real asshole, isn't he? So one of the reasons we don't see a lot of the violence is because it's exported. And another reason we don't see a lot of the violence is because we've been so metabolized into the system that we bought into this strange notion that it's okay to have to pay to exist on the planet. That's really, really weird. And if you don't pay, then some guy with a gun is going to come and bad things are going to happen to you. A few years ago, I got a call from a friend of mine. She's an environmental activist. She was crying, and she said, this work's just killing me, it's breaking my heart. I said, yeah, I know, it'll do that. And then she said, the dominant culture hates everything, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it does, even itself. She said, it has a death urge, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it does. She said, unless it's stopped, it's gonna kill everything on the planet, isn't it? I said, yeah, it is, unless it's stopped. And then she said, we're not going to make some great new glorious tomorrow, are we? Ninety-eight percent of the old growth forests are gone. Ninety-nine percent of the prairies are gone. 80% of the rivers on this planet do not support life anymore. 
we are out of species, we're out of soil, and we are out of time. And what we're being told by most of the environmental movement is that the way to stop all of this is through personal consumer choices. By simply purchasing our product, the consumer can make a small, easy step to a greener earth. So by taking that one roll and buying that one roll, you can help save millions of trees. I think we can really look at the history of the environmental movement to tell us a lot about why it hasn't been working. There was a lot of pretty radical and militant environmentalism happening, especially in the 70s and 80s, and in a lot of ways that was kind of a heyday for environmentalism. You know, Greenpeace was founded. It, it started to become very mainstream in some quarters to be an environmentalist. And then there was also a shift around that time when um, corporations realized that they could sell a lot of things by, by calling them green. Greenwashing is an attempt by corporations to, to put labels on their activity uh, that are popular and that appeal to people's sensibility about, about and concern for the environment and for ecology. For the vast majority of people within society today that there's a, a total sense of denial and disconnect uh, between uh, what they think is good and right and then their actions uh, as a society or as a civilization um, especially as it relates to the natural world. I have a real problem with a lot of the quote solutions end quote that are put forward by people because they confuse what is real with what is not real. What they do is they take the industrial economy as a given. How can we save the industrial economy and oh it would be nice if we still have a planet. It doesn't matter if I buy, you know, hemp soap if there's a runaway greenhouse effect and the planet becomes uninhabitable. The modern mainstream environmental movement of the big environmental organizations, Greenpeace and Sierra Club and the others, is rooted in that very same cultural lie that nature is resources. Nature is things to be used and managed. Nature is a as the philosopher Martin Heidegger put it, just a vast gasoline station that we can just endlessly extract from. They may say we need to manage it more wisely, but as long as they maintain the mindset that we are the lords of creation and creation exists for us as resources to be transformed into commodities for us to buy and sell, as long as they maintain that perspective on what it means to be an environmentalist, then they're, they're working within the same framework of an ultimately self-destructive path that, 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 that the culture is on. The marketplace is also going to be very important. Many customers have been pushing for change in the boreal forest. The Forest Products Association and its 21 member companies are responding to the demand for greener products. And that marketplace is going to pay close attention. Uh, if the change isn't happening, then they're going to put pressure on the parties who are part of the agreement, the environmental organizations, the forest products companies, to do uh, the things that they've set out to do. And they will reward the companies when things begin to be implemented and the change happens on the ground. Fully confident. One interesting piece of the agreement is uh, with Greenpeace, David Suzuki, Forest Ethics, Canadian Parks and Wilderness on our side. When someone else comes and tries to bully us, the agreement actually requires that they come and work with us in repelling the attack and we'll be able to say, fight me, fight my gang. I personally have no use for large institutionalized environmental organizations. I think they're more of a problem than a, than a help. Uh, they're just eco-bureaucracies. And you know, I won't name any because I don't like to badmouth organizations except for one, which I feel that I can, and that's Greenpeace. And the reason I can criticize Greenpeace is I am a co-creator of Greenpeace, and therefore I feel like Dr. Frankenstein sometimes. And I feel that since I help create the thing, I can certainly criticize it. And I think that Greenpeace has become uh, the world's biggest feel-good organization now. People join it to feel good, to feel I'm part of the solution, I'm not part of the problem. Greenpeace brings in close to $300 million a year. And uh, what do they do with that money? Generate more money. And the people who are at the top of the totem pole now are not environmentalists. They're fundraisers, they're, they're accountants, they're lawyers, they're business people. 
fact people are voting with their dollars at the checkout stands. It's because they know the polling shows that the public cares. And, you know, ultimately they're going to care about their profit margin and whether they can sell products. What's happened in British Columbia with the, the environmental movement, you know, it's been stalemated, you know. The big, the big uh, leaders, they're compromised. You know, they went in bed and it snuffed out that movement. So what happened was there was direct action, there were blockades, there was an international market campaign that put a lot of pressure on the companies that were logging in the Great Bear Rainforest. But the end result was that that all fed into a closed door negotiation with Sephora Berman leading the negotiation, or as chief negotiator on the conservationist side, where a lot of the, the groups that actually did the work, the direct actions, and did the market campaigns were shut out of the process. Public oversight was removed and the protocol agreements that were signed with First Nations and with conservation groups were basically shunted aside. And so the, the, the protocol agreements gave the negotiators a mandate to, to negotiate for 40 to 60 percent conservation, uh, but what happened was they agreed to 20 percent. It's not strange to me when people tell me that Oh, you know that the former president of Greenpeace now works for the logging industry of Canada. The former president of Greenpeace Australia now works for the mining industry. The former president of Greenpeace Norway works for the whaling industry. See, because it's just one corporate job to the next. The only measure by which we'll be judged by those who come after is the health of the land and the health of the water, the health of the earth. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we recycle. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we wrote our legislators. They're not going to give a shit as to how hard we tried. What they're going to care about is whether they can breathe the air and drink the water, whether the land will support them. And they're not going to care how hard we try. They're not going to care about any of that. What they're going to care about is do we live on a living planet? Okay, so um, I don't know if you know this, but um, the original draft of the movie Star Wars was not written by uh, Lucas. The original draft was written by environmentalists, and it's, it's a little bit different. For one thing, it wasn't actually called Star Wars. It was called Star Nonviolent Civil Disobedience. But the plot of Star Wars, for those of you who don't remember, is that the Empire has created this, this giant machine called a Death Star. And it's a machine that's capable of destroying entire planets. In the movie, the rebels find a way to destroy the Death Star. And then at the very end, Luke Skywalker uses the force to get past all the TIE fighters and to drop a, a torpedo down a thermal exhaust port and to blow up the Death Star. Once again, the first draft of the movie, written by environmentalists, was, was a bit different. The rebels didn't actually blow up the Death Star. Instead, they used other methods to slow the intergalactic march of empire. For example, they um, set up programs for people on planets about to be destroyed to produce luxury items like hemp hacky sacks and gourmet coffee for sale to inhabitants of the Death Star. Audience members will also discover there are plans afoot to encourage loads of troopers and other citizens of the Empire to take eco-tours of doomed planets. Their purpose will be to show to one and all that these planets are economically important to the Empire and so should not be destroyed. In a surprise move that will get viewers to the edges of their seats, other groups of rebels file lawsuits against the Empire, attempting to show that the environmental impact statement that Darth Vader was required to file failed to adequately support his decision that blowing up the planet would cause no significant impact. Viewers will thrill to learn of plans to boycott items produced by corporations that have Darth Vader on the board of directors. 
and they'll leap to their feet in theaters worldwide when they see bags full of letters written directly to Mr. Vader himself, asking that he please not blow up any more planets. Now, we all know that that would be enough not only to bring the Empire to its knees, but to make a damn fine and exciting movie. The thing is, there's more. Thousands of renegade rebels, unhappy with what they perceive as toadying on the part of mainstream rebels, decide in a scene guaranteed to bring tears to even the eyes of the most cold-hearted theatergoers to stand on planets about to be destroyed, link arms, and sing Give Peace a Chance. They send DVDs of that to Darth Vader and his boss, the Grand Moff Tarkin, to whom they also send wave after wave of loving kindness. A few of the rebels sneak aboard the Death Star and they lock themselves down to various pieces of equipment, and stirring debates are held on screen as to whether the rebels should voluntarily surrender on approach of the troopers or whether they should remain locked down to the end. <laughs> And in a brilliant and brave touch of authenticity, the rebels are never able to come to consensus. But there's more. Once inside the Death Star, there's a splinter group breaks off. They burn a couple of transporters, and they etch Galaxy Liberation Front. And then another group breaks off from that group, and they finally make it to Darth Vader's private room. And when they get there, they sneak up behind him, and then they hit him with a vegan cream pie. And the, the directors decided to cut that because it was way too close to a scene in another movie they were developing at the same time called The Plot to Pie Hitler. As the Death Star looms directly overhead, a few of the rebels advocate picking up weapons to fight back. And those rebels are generally shouted down by the pacifist rebels, who argue that attacking those who run the Death Star is just another example of the Empire's harmful philosophy coming in by the back door. If we want to change Darth Vader, they say, we must first become that change ourselves. To change Darth Vader's heart, we must first change our own. We must, above all else, have compassion for Darth Vader. And remember that he, too, was once a child. So finally, Lee, Luke, Han, Chewbacca, and a couple of robots show up, and they tell these others they found a way to blow up the whole Death Star. And the rest of the rebels, of course, are just horrified. There's a scuffle breaks out between Lee, Luke, Han, Chewbacca, and the two robots on one side, and the pacifists on the other. And the pacifists chase those four from the room and from the film, which is not a big deal, because they're minor characters anyway. But anyway, the way the movie ends is that the Death Star looms closer and closer, and then you see the Death Star, and then you see the planet, and then you see the Death Star, you see the planet, and then you see the Death Star, and you see the lasers start to glow this hellish red, and then you see the planet again, and they see pssst, this little light, and what that is, that's the environmentalist getting away before the planet gets blown up. And then you see the, the Death Star again, and then it blows up the planet. And then the, the final shot of the movie, which reveals what a complete triumph this was for the rebels, is a still showing an article on the lower left of page 43 of the New Empire Times that devotes a full three sentences to the destruction of the planet. So it's like, yeah, we got some press. The public really needs to understand that no combination of alternative uh, of miracle fuels or biodiesel or ethanol or nuclear or sun or solar or use French fried potato oil, no combination of these things is going to allow us to keep a happy motoring society going. We are using up all the very easily excess energy sources and we've really built this huge way of life based on cheap oil essentially. The world as we know it, which relies entirely on oil to function, is, uh, is nearing its end. We are headed for the crash. That oil is not going to come again. Tar sands are probably one of the biggest industrial projects in the history of mankind. 
The tar sands are the largest, most destructive environmental project on the planet right now. It's oil extraction. It's uh, some of the dirtiest oil on the planet, which means that it takes the most energy to extract. And the reason that we're uh, extracting this particular brand of dirty, dirty oil is because there's no other oil left to extract. Tar sands really aren't oil. Effectively, the process by which you mine and refine tar sands is effectively adding about 100 million years of development through a synthetic process. The tar sand deposit in an area that covers the size of the state of New York or larger than England is already considered the largest industrial project in human history and it's barely begun. They extract it from the sand by steaming and heating water and basically boiling it. So the oil sits on top of the on top of the water like a froth and then they scrape it off and that's the bitumen. There's mining processes and in situ processes and both of them are pretty much trying to extract bitumen out of the sand. To produce one barrel of oil, you have to first, after you've cleared off the ground and broken all the trees down and so forth, then dig a pit which can be up to 200 feet deep. For each barrel of oil, there's four barrels of water used in a process called a slurry where you spin it at a high speed, high velocity with high temperatures of water to separate the bitumen, which is the pre-synthetic oil, from the sands itself and all of the clays and silts. But that's after you've already dug out what has to be hundreds of tons of earth. The energy that's required to actually do that is um, approximately, um, people say for almost every barrel of oil you need about a half a barrel of energy just to produce this. So for every barrel of energy input is two barrels of um, oil that are produced. Whereas with conventional crude it was very, very minor in terms of the um, energy that's inputted to actually get the crude oil out. So the ratio that's most important to talk about is a ratio you could use in a country like Iraq, where for each barrel of oil you use to try to get more oil, you'll get about a hundred barrels back. The Athabasca River, which runs through northern Alberta, where you have like many different native communities living along the river, is being sucked of its water to fuel the tar sands operations. Because of the contamination of the river uh, from, from oil sands discharges of things like um, oil and grease and treated sewage into the Athabasca River, and sometimes there's accidents of spills of these toxic chemicals directly into the Athabasca Rivers. The community of Fort Chippewan, both the Mikisu Cree and the Dene uh, Chippewan First Nation who have been fighting and really at the front of like raising the alarm about what's happening. And their community has been, been seeing um, all this rise in, in rare cancers, autoimmune diseases, um, arsenic in, in the land, the moose meat, the fish are high levels of heavy metals, mercuries. Basically the whole environment up there is contaminated. How this is affecting my community is that it's killing off the people of Fort Chippewan. It's what I've called before a slow industrial genocide. Um, I buried my auntie, I buried my uncle, I got an auntie living with it. And this is a war for our lives because the government is allowing the people of Fort Chip to die. The tar sands are not only fueling the destruction of the second fastest rate of deforestation in the world outside of the Amazon River Basin, they are already the second fastest contributor to climate change in North America and with the goals of production that they're talking about, the CO2 emissions will make it so the only way you could outstrip a climate change contributor for all of North America would be to combine all of the coal-fired power plants from Alberta to Arizona and in between across all of North America. I think that the tar sands is the absurdity of still desiring oil when we know so well that, for example, fresh water is just an elemental part of human existence and that we're running full force towards extracting these last little bits of oil to sustain this plastic culture, this plastic civilization, to the destruction of the environment in which we can live. 
People say it's like the world's addicted to crack and this is like the, the dirtiest and most disgusting form of crack that will keep it addicted for a, lo a lot longer, right? Like this is actually what it is. It is the most insane thing that people are doing. We probably agree that civilization is going to crash whether or not we help bring this about. If you don't agree with this, we probably have nothing to say to each other. We probably also agree that this crash will be messy. We agree further that since industrial civilization is systematically dismantling the ecological infrastructure of the planet, the sooner civilization comes down, whether or not we help it crash, the more life will remain afterwards to support both humans and non-humans. The genesis of Endgame, really, the book, was really because I did some talks around the possibility of fighting back and the response by the audience was really predictable. If it was an audience made up of sort of mainstream environmentalists and peace and social justice activists, often they would put up what I've taken to calling a Gandhi shield, which is they would say the names Martin Luther King, Dalai Lama, and Gandhi again and again as fast as they can to keep all evil thoughts at bay. And if it was grassroots environmentalists, they would do the same thing, but then they would come up to me afterwards and they would say, thank you so much for bringing this up. Especially in North America, the pacifists and nonviolent advocates have had a very defining role and even a censoring role in determining what other people's participation can be in a whole range of social struggles. And, and that the, the way that they've affected social struggles has, been, has made it very much easier for the state to control those social struggles. That nonviolence plays a function of, of, of recuperating social struggles, of, of taking out their teeth, of making them harmless, so that they can just uh, exist in this cesspool of democratic plurality. I wonder what happens to that kind of energy or idealism or faith that something is about to change when it's certainly not going to change at all? And what are the false hopes that keep us tied to the system? What are the false hopes that bind us to unlivable situations and blind us to real possibilities? Does anybody really think that warehouses are going to stop deforesting because we ask nicely? Does anybody think that Monsanto will stop Monsantoing because we ask nicely? I was talking to this person in the state several years ago and they said if we can just get a Democrat in the White House, things are going to be okay. We've got a couple of myths on the left that I would really encourage us to get over. The first is that social change happens by moral suasion. It doesn't. It happens by force. The problem with, with persuasion as a strategy is that it only works on people who can actually be convinced and who can, you know, be relied upon to act from their position after their minds have been changed. And the problem is that we're not dealing with individuals who can be convinced or persuaded. We're dealing mostly with large, abstract social organizations and corporations, which are basically sociopaths made out of huge numbers of people. You can't argue with psychopaths, you can't argue with fascists, and you can't argue with those who are benefiting from an economic system. You have to stop them through some form of force, and that force can be violent or nonviolent. Could you have stopped Ted Bundy by peaceful means? The left, uh, to a large extent, uh, subconsciously, has as its primary role to make resistance harmless. States have, have recognized that resistance will never disappear, that struggles will never disappear. And in the past, they tried suppressing struggles the first time that they, uh, that, they, that they showed their heads, that there was any sign of them, and that proved ineffective. So nowadays, the way that states rule is by accepting the inevitability of, of conflict and resistance and just trying to manage it permanently. Keep the march going. There's nothing happening here. There's nothing happening. Just one more line of police. So please keep the march going. Social movements in North America are locked into this pacifist doctrine that is imposed by the middle class reformists who want to control the movement and dictate how it conducts itself. 
advocates of nonviolence they they frequently say that nonviolence works, and the principal examples that they use of that are Gandhi in India and Martin Luther King in the U.S. The problem with that is that this constitutes a really great historical whitewashing. That uh, in fact the resistance in India was incredibly diverse, and Gandhi was a very important figure within that resistance. But the resistance was by no means pacifist in its entirety. Gandhi gets used as a way to shut down conversation. Especially in the West, Gandhi is used as a way to sort of uh, quell any ideas of either direct action or what's perceived as violence, or um, sort of like you know resistance that goes beyond what is um, seen as sort of like a, um, a pacifist or a, a peaceful means of um, resistance. For years, I I really bought into the whole Gandhian myth that, that that is really sort of forced down the throat of activists in the United States. And the people who disabused me of that myth were when I first actually met some people from India. The people I talked to certainly didn't deify him, and many of them despised him. And they felt he was a collaborator, and he was somebody whom the British could work with. Gandhi's very well known in the West, but when you go to India, there's a, a freedom fighter and revolutionary leader called Bhagat Singh, who's in India probably almost as well known as Gandhi, as um, a part of the independence movement and sort of a leader in the independence movement. But in the West, most people probably have never heard his name. And the reason why that is is that he used direct action tactics. There were um, generals of the British army that were killed. There was a bomb thrown in a British assembly to basically attract the attention of the public. There were you know, weapons that people were getting off of railway cards. with uh, Gandhi and the Indian National Congress where you had the moderates and the extremists. The moderates were legal constitutional reform was their only method and they were criticized for being a middle-class clique, for being too slow, uh, for being too legalistic and for being basically ineffective. The extremists on the other hand were being accused of being of being too aggressive, of, of being too fast and reckless and irresponsible. Gandhi basically got negotiating power from the fact that there were that there were other elements in the struggle which were even more threatening to British dominance. So the British specifically chose to dialogue with Gandhi because he was perhaps for them the least threatening of the important elements of resistance. Gandhi came in as being the middleman. His theory of nonviolent passive resistance seemed to be a bridge between the extremists and the moderates. The British were bled white after World War II and didn't have the morale left anymore for a big fight. And they helped choose somebody that they could, that they could work with. They knew a revolution was coming and they wanted to blunt it as much as they could. India went from being a colony to a neo-colony. Uh, the British were still able to maintain their interests less directly with, uh, with, with Indians being in positions of management. My problem isn't with somebody doing nonviolent actions. It never has been. I mean, I say all the time that we need it all. My problem is that so many pacifists, especially in the United States, end up not supporting more radical or militant work. The problem when that this debate comes up is, is that you can't just assume that people that are resisting and are using a means of resistance haven't thought about what they're doing. And that's what I think often is the problem. When people decide to take certain actions and when people decide that, hey, you know, our marches aren't enough or they're doing this or doing that, there's this assumption by a lot of people that want to toe the Gandhi line is, is that, oh, they're just not thinking about it. What most states will choose to do in, the, in similar circumstances is to find the, the elements of the resistance that are most easy to control and most easy to co-opt, to negotiate with them, and then to hand over power to them in order to, to continue uh, the system that had already existed. So again, you have the state doing the same thing it did with Gandhi and Martin Luther King. It does with, for example, the environmental movement. So it invites the responsible leaders of the environmental movement in 
to inquiries, government commissions, debates. It recognizes them. They're the legitimate leaders because, again, it doesn't want the movement to begin to adopt more militant resistance uh, tactics. The powerful do not ever give up without a struggle. I mean, those are the famous words of Frederick Douglass when he said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. If we use more efficient electricity appliances, we can save this much off of the global warming pollution that would otherwise be put into the atmosphere. If we use other end-use efficiency this much, if we have higher mileage cars this much, and all these begin to add up, other transport efficiency, renewable technology, we have everything we need, save perhaps political will. But you know what? In America, political will is a renewable resource. When we see solutions, all the so-called solutions put forward to global warming, the thing they all have in common is that they take industrial civilization as a given and they take the natural world as, as the dependent variable. It's all about saving civilization and that's entirely backwards. What it should be is we need to do whatever it takes to save life on the planet. In the next 40 to 50 years, we're going to see the extinction of more species than we've seen in the past 65 million years. That, to me, is a red light and a siren going off as a call to people who will cut through the crap and do what is necessary to protect the Earth for here and now and for future generations. It is you that are going to have to answer to your children 50, 75 years from now when they ask what you did during the eco wars. And in that sense, I think each one of us has to live the life today, this very moment, doing the things that we would be proud to tell our ancestors about. If we are serious about saving life on Earth, we've got to start fighting back in the ways that people do when they realize they need to form a serious resistance movement. Most indigenous populations who maintain any sense of a traditional uh, worldview know that the way of life that uh, settler society has imposed on this land is unsustainable. Yet there's been a, a sense that we really need to kind of wait until it collapses or wait until they're done doing or they've reached their, their limit and they can't continue the way that they've been going on and be patient. Fuck patience. have a lot of trouble kind of thinking about or wrapping their heads around. And the problem is that this culture has clearly defined hierarchy. There are people who are clearly in power and who benefit from power and who benefit from destroying the planet and who benefit from exploiting other people. And they've been doing that for a long time. And their power is more important to them than anything else. There is no personal consumer choice that is going to dismantle the systems of power that are behind the destruction of our planet. What we need is organized political resistance. You cannot just simply ask the state for these reforms or for any kind of gains or concessions. You have to force them to do it. And that's the power of disruption. It was a bloody day at the Mohawk Indian community in Oka, Quebec, near Montreal. Provincial police in riot gear stormed the barricades the Mohawks had set up. There were clouds of tear gas, a hail of bullets, and in the midst of the battle, a policeman was killed. All this because of a dispute over a piece of forest the Indians claim is theirs. A forest town council wants to bulldoze to expand the local golf course. The police retreated as abruptly as they'd attacked, leaving behind their cruisers. They also left a heavy front-end loader, which the Mohawks immediately put to their own use. The police cruisers, crushed and useless, became barricades themselves. We treat these trees and the land like our mother. These people are raping our mother. What would you do if they raped your mother? 
these politicians are servants of the system. It's their job to keep it going. It's their job to keep profit rolling in for the ruling class. And they will never, ever act in the people's interests or in the interests of the planet. It doesn't matter what we say. The only thing that they will respond to is force and the threat of social disruption. And even if we, if we allow them to stay in power, they will always take back any gain that we manage to get from them. It's really important to recognize that no struggle is, is done, that, that there's not any possibility of, of any lasting victory as long as the state still exists. But we can definitely see in the histories of struggle, small gains have been won and ways in which we've empowered ourselves uh, by the use of all tactics. And, and I think it's, it's, it's not even important to, to really say if a, ta if a particular tactic is, is violent or not, because this is just kind of a... Um, a moral category meant to, meant to restrict action, I think it's more important to look at which, which tactics can be, can be empowering uh, and, and liberating and useful. Purely above ground means are designed to facilitate the expansion of global capitalism. These are serious power structures that are making vast sums of money. They are backed up by the power of the armed state in every way imaginable. They've got armies on their side, they own the mass media, the banks, all the money is on their side. If there's any doubt about the leadership that our military is showing, you just need to look at this F-18 fighter and the light armored vehicle behind me. The Army and Marine Corps have been testing this vehicle on a mixture of biofuels. And this Navy fighter jet appropriately called the Green Hornet, will be flown for the first time in just a few days on Earth Day. Come on, let us shoot. A push master, Crazy Horse 1A. They're taking him. Push master, Crazy Horse 1A. This is Bushmaster 7, go ahead. Roger, we have a black SUV or a bongo truck picking up the bodies. Fuck. Request permission to engage. Bushmaster 7, roger. This is Bushmaster 7, So if the law will not do the right thing, other people will have to do the right thing, and they'll have to do the right thing by breaking the law. And that precedent has been set many times throughout our history. The people who saved the Jews from the German Nazis broke the law for a higher ethical purpose. The people who liberated slaves in our country through the Underground Railroad system to protect them from slave masters and a very barbaric law in the United States at that time. they did the right thing. They broke the law for a higher ethical purpose. We need to start and get out there and go beyond hitting like on Facebook and signing online petitions. We need to be out there in the real world fighting back. I think one of the things that we really have to accept and internalize is that the majority of institutions and the majority of people are never going to be on our side. And so we have to sit down as individual activists and as communities of resistance, as a culture of resistance, and we have to say, okay, well, what will it take to stop this culture from destroying the planet? You know, part of the answer is obviously that persuasion hasn't worked and persuasion is not going to work. If we want to be successful, then we have to look at what resistance movements in the past have done and, and what they've learned and kind of the, the different phases that they've gone through as they've tried to assert themselves and try to be successful. When I say organized political resistance, I mean that we need to face power head on. Once you name power, you will find that power is sociopathic, that the people in charge will do whatever it takes to shut you up. The thing about when you enter into a greater a period of social conflict, what you don't want is people promoting nonviolence because that's going to disarm the people. It's going to disarm the people in the face of an aggressive enemy and in the face of uh, 
of hard social conditions. You want them to have a, a stronger fighting spirit because without a fighting spirit, you lack the will to resist. The smartest thing the Nazis did was they made it so that at every step of the way it was in the Jews' rational best interest to not resist. Would you rather get an ID card or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? Do you want to move to a ghetto or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? Do you want to get on a cattle car or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? Do you want to take a shower or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? At every step of the way it was in their rational self-interest to not resist. But I'll tell you something very important which is the Jews who participated in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had a higher rate of survival than those who went along. I think if any of us were alive in Nazi Germany right now, we would know what a resistance movement should be doing. And we need to think about the culture of industrial civilization as if it's a culture of occupation, because it is. If Nazis or other fascists took over North America, what would we all do? What would we do if they implemented Mussolini's definition of fascism? Fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it's a merger of state and corporate power. What if this occupied country called itself a democracy, but most everyone understood elections to be shams, with citizens allowed to choose between different wings of the same fascist or following Mussolini corporate party? What if anti-government activity was opposed by stormtroopers and secret police? Would you fight back? If there already existed a resistance movement, would you join it? Would you resist if the fascists irradiated the countryside, poisoned food supplies, made rivers unfit for swimming, and so filthy you wouldn't even dream of drinking from them anymore? If fascists systematically deforested the continent, would you join an underground army of resistance, head to the forests, and from there to boardrooms in the halls of the Reichstag to pick off the occupying deforesters, and most especially those who give them their marching orders? Give me a threshold. Give me a specific point at which you finally take a stand. If you can't or won't give that threshold, why not? Yeah, yo, I ain't got any time to waste on this one. I gotta get right on it, like yo. When I face the page, I place the rage, place it into stasis. I write it and erase it. That's a basis, cover all the bases. Watch what you say on the cell, they gonna trace it. Zack Death, don't expect any aces. Camera eyes, watch you in public places. And I hate this, so I take this mic and I write like these words on my legs and they walk me through my paces. People chase it, glittery lights, but I've seen the heights. My time is not wasted, I'm tracing the sky. Who weed smoke that I took took me to all the spaces of mine. And time. Look, just face it, this life is mine That's why I'm not racing the finish line We'll come with time The moment designed to shine, I won't replace it So I take my time, grind it up and break it Roll it up so fine, light it up and blaze it Smoke a blunt, smoke them up And time's on the grind, train them for the signs Take your fist and raise it up to the sky See the fire in the eye, do it, do not do There is no try, hard to find what's true That is no lie, if they clip your wings How you gonna fly? You're gonna lie, you're gonna die So until that day, are you gonna try One by one, we multiply Eyes to the sun, just let it shine now Now get into it Now choose your side We got to do it The time is right Now get into it Now change your life Only you can do it The time is right Any more 
pollution and you gon' fry So get into it, it's do or die With no action, factions, a crew is divide But you can't be stupid if you choose to ride And you can't ride the fence, better choose your side Keep doing what you're told, or do what's right You gonna roll over, or you gon' fight No justice, no peace, the war's tonight And I'm a poltergeist, you know a violent spirit Product of a world with too much violence in it So many people, trees and animals are dying a minute Can't ask them to stop, they ain't trying to hear it until we get physical, there ain't gonna fear it To go to war with the machine, start trying to kill it Until it dies, every day's a violent day And they expect you to protest and silence the state Pacifist and unaffected while we die in decay We need to rise up, fuck, kneel and pray Preachers and teachers, lead us astray Politicians and cops, all they see is obey Your corporate masses, buy what they got in the spleen Stop buying the shit, start making them pay To hell with the games, we ain't gonna play Let's fight them till they kill us or they take us away Start throwing them all Stop throwing bouquets Take it to these bastards like tankers in scale Monkey wrench machines and right communiques A wall to spray paint just big circle A's Now get into it Now choose your side We got to do it The time is right Now get into it Now change your life Only you can do it The time is right to them, you're playing right into your own destruction.